helpful uh, for you all to kind of do a case-based lecture to talk about some of the emergencies and uh, talk about uh, kind of important uh, clinical signs and symptoms to recognize uh, so that uh, diagnoses and treatment get uh, made promptly because as you're going to see from some of these cases, uh, that's really critical. Uh, there are also interspersed in here, you know, we want to make this evidence-based and so we don't want to just do things based on anecdote or anything like that. So uh, throughout the talk, we'll be talking about some evidence-based recommendations about certain um, conditions and how we can implement that into how we treat our patients. So this is going to be case-based. It's also going to be very interactive. Please ask questions along the way, and uh, I will be asking you questions, too, because I want to know what you think about the cases you're seeing and how you would approach them. All right. So we're going to just jump right in. Before I came to Downstate, I actually worked at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse. So like, I'm just hitting all the SUNYs. I'll get to Stony Brook at some point. Or, but um, the, you know, the um, interesting part of working in Syracuse was that, you know, it is a, uh, has a very wide catchment area. We got referrals from, you know, sometimes two or three hours away. And the other difference in the type of traumas that you see there is that, you know, um, any of you who've been there know that the hospital literally sits right by I-81 highway. So um, the types of traumas that you see when there's that kind of high speed possibility is different than the types of traumas that we see here in Central Brooklyn where MBEs really aren't as much as a, of a factor compared to say like falls and interpersonal violence. So that impacts the type of disruption that you see and the magnitude of the trauma that you see. But anyway, so these first couple of cases are some Syracuse patients and I think you'll see they're impressive and this is why they were included. So. Um, I was uh, literally like uh, walking on my way home and then I get this page from one of the residents who says, don't go home, just come to the emergency room and meet me. Uh, so he, this was a young 33 year old man who had, was at work, he was a plumber, there was some, to this day I still don't totally understand how this happened, but long and short of it was there was some crazy explosion, he was working on a, like a porcelain sink in someone's house, he got, cut on his cheek and well you guys tell me what you think <clears throat> so um he's holding that towel there because when he removes it it just starts bleeding profusely so one of the first things in a situation like this so this is like an eight centimeter laceration basically from the common shore up toward the trachis so obviously in a situation like this the primary goal is just to get bleeding under control now, what is something that you could do wrong initially if he was bleeding profusely? Like, what would be maybe something that could cause problems in, in an attempt to get bleeding under control? Yeah, just blindly starting to clamp things or tying things because you will see there are some structures here that you have to preserve and identify. And if you haven't done that yet in an attempt to get bleeding under control, however well-meaning that is, you could damage those structures even more. So in a situation like this, pressure, resuscitating him is important until uh, we can kind of get a handle more on what's been injured. So, um, I'm not sure what those pictures are, but essentially the idea here was to, uh, <laughs> this is to emphasize the point that he's bleeding a lot, okay? Um, yeah, anyway. Um, I think the point of this picture was to, well, okay, so you see this man, you can see where the injury is. What, are, what is some information you want, for the, now the bleeding's under control, what is some information you want right away? Yeah. Say that again? Who said that? Yeah, who said that? What's your name? David. Hey, Taylor. Okay, so um, you're worried about the facial nerve here? I think that's a good thing to worry about. Is there any, are any other structures in this area you worry about, Taylor? Yeah. Who said that? What's your name? What's your name? Linda. Hey, Linda. All right, great. So you, we are worried about the parotid gland. We're also worried about the parotid duct, right? Mm -hmm. You can assume that the gland is kind of macerated in here. And that's not as um, serious, right, as the duct being injured, which is a much more delicate structure, hard to identify. Okay, great, yes. So I think these pictures were meant to uh, emphasize that he's got some facial weakness issues, but... Uh, all right, so this is in the operating room. Right, so first situation, first decision to make is that this is not going to be closed in the emergency room like with local, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not gonna do that. Well, you laugh, right? But I mean, even something small,
smaller than this in a sensitive location or in a child where you really have to make sure that you get proper approximation of specific structures. And I tell our residents all the time, have a low threshold for going to the operating room. You'll have better sedation of the patient or, you know, this patient needed general, obviously. Um, you have better lighting, you have a bogey. There is no point in struggling in the emergency room in a case like this or something similar. Just make the decision to go to the OR and you'll save everybody a lot of time. Okay, so um, what are we seeing here exactly? Well, there's a lacrimal probe here. And what, do you, what are we cannulating there? Yeah, right. So the stents and stuff orifice is everybody sees it when you look in someone's mouth, right? It's opposite the second molar tooth, the maxillary arch. Um, so when you have a suspected product duct injury, you've got to find both ends, right? You have to find the proximal end and the distal end. The distal end is often easier to find, right? Because you know you can cannulate that through the mouth. And obviously, this confirms that the product duct has been cut, right? Because you should not see the probe in the wound if the product duct is intact. So, all right, so we found the distal end. How do you find the proximal end? That's actually a lot harder. Um, because if it's been cut and it's jagged, it may be evolved, there may be parts of the tissue missing. One of the things that you can do, and in fact, one of the things that you can do in the um, emergency room, if you're not sure that there's a product duct injury, is you actually start milking the gland, right? So you massage the product gland, and if you see saliva in the wound, then you know that the duct has been cut. So that's what we did. At, luckily, the, the duct was not hard to find here, so we were able to work on that. So then the other thing you have to do is identify the nerve branches that have been cut. So we knew they were lower facial nerve branches, right? Because he had perfect movement of, you know, his forehead and eye closure. But what this net diagram shows is that when you have a laceration through this mid part of the cheek, um, there is an intimate relationship between the parotid duct and uh, the buccal branch is not far away, the zygomatic <coughs> branch is not far away, so suspect that these other branches have been cut. And then you've got to identify those, again, same thing, right, proximal and distal nerve branches. And you do that with the nerve stimulator. So uh, the other important takeaway point here is that if you have something, I mean, obviously this is severe, but even if you have something that's not as wide and there's a cut and the patient has facial weakness, oh, the other thing, too, is if you um, inject Lido in somebody before you've, like, made that determination about where the nerve weakness is, they may be weak because a lot of cane like diffuses to the nerve branches. So again, just it's it can be hard to kind of think those things through when someone's profusely bleeding, but it's important to keep those things in your mind. Um, you only have three days between um, a cut of a nerve branch and the ability to um, stimulate a distal nerve branch with a nerve stimulator because the nerves undergo something called valerian degeneration. So again. Um, Time is everything, it's the bottom line. Okay, so this picture shows the repaired duct and the nerve branches that were cut, use tiny, tiny suture, and then the laceration repaired. All right, so now he wakes up, oh yeah, shoot. So let's say we're in the community and he is like an hour away, and he's like this. Mm -hmm. Is this something that would be helpful for us to try to handle the duct from inside the seat? Not really. I, no, I think that's going to happen in the OR anyway. I think the best thing to do is just try to get the bleeding under control, get it packed. You know, you can pack a wound like this. You can wrap him with a Barton dressing. You guys know what that is, right? You, it's it's kind of old school. People used to use them for mandible fractures. Basically, you just get a curlex and you wrap his head. Like he may not even be able to open his mouth, but that's okay. Get pressure on tamper knife. Um, I think those are the most important things, you know, give him his tetanus shot, give him antibiotics, and then either transfer him to a place that can do it, or, you know, those things I would suggest. Yeah. All right, so now this is uh, maybe six weeks later. So the incision is healed well, but he's still weak. Why? Because we've only put the nerves back together, the nerves still have to heal. So he still has a little bit of facial droop here. Patients can take up to 12 months for a nerve to heal even after you've repaired them primarily. So <clears throat> now here he is about a year later. So he's still a smidge weak, but he's definitely got, so the important thing here um, in terms of assessing or determining whether you've been successful is not, or not is when you look at him at rest, he's got good tone, right? If we had not been able to repair those nerve branches or if the nerve repair had been unsuccessful, you probably just have a, a facial droop at rest. 
So he's got good tone. When he smiles, he's got a little bit of asymmetry, but he gets good excursion. He's got like that good nasal labial fold. So um, yeah, you tell patients up to 12 months to see the final effect of the nerve repair. So the scar looks good. You, we leave a, a stint in the duct uh, so that it doesn't scar down and you take that out about a week later. <coughs> All right, so kind of in summary, in a cheek injury like this, the structures to evaluate are facial nerve function, broad duct injury, and then immediate exploration if you're concerned about any of those being uh, injured. All right, next one, another Syracuse case. Conveyor belt injury. So this man went to work, and he had a long ponytail, okay? He got too close to a conveyor belt. So just remember, I, you all know, I don't have to tell you guys this, the scalp is extremely vascular. People can bleed to death from a scalping injury, right? The reason it's got such great blood supply is because it gets its, its blood supply from two sources, external carotid and internal carotid branches. So, this is the injury. So, who knows what scalp stands for? It's an acronym. What's the stand for? Skin, right? What's C? <laughs> yeah, so cute fat, right? Yes. What's A? Right, daily aponeurosis, right? What's the L? Uh-huh, loose areolar tissue. P is pericranium, right, or periosteum. So when someone's scalp, scalp moves, the, it's, the gliding layer is the loose areolar tissue layer, right? The pericranium is fixed to the bone. The loose areolar tissue is very... Um, forgiving, and that's the glide layer. So when someone has a scalping injury, generally the scalping happens in that loose areolar tissue plane, which does not pre present really significant uh, resistance to a pulling force. So in general, the pericranium will be left down and the rest of the scalp will be pulled off. In this situation, we had kind of a composite problem. Centrally, you can see there's actually some pericranium that's been ripped off, so that's bare bone. Can you can see there's a difference, right? Here, there's a little bit more soft tissue, so that's pericranium left, that's bare bone. That actually makes this harder, right? Because in terms of uh, what we did to reconstruct him, having just bare bone, you've got to do some things. But anyway, they were smart enough to think about bringing the flap of tissue, right? Because you can, um, I think the first described successful microvascular reimplantation of scalp was in the late 70s. Um, and it's just, it's a, a kind of an expansion of all the microvascular techniques that we use in like head and neck free flap surgery, uh, transplant surgery, things like that. Um, but you've got to have a good recipient vessel and a good donor vessel. And you cannot find anything in this. So obviously, you can't just reattach that, right? You can't just plop that back down, put some staples in. And you're laughing. I, I'm going to show you a case later. You can't because this is a composite graft, right? This is not just skin. This is. All those layers you were just telling me about, there's no way this would just survive on its own without an artery medium. So if you cannot microvascularly <laughs> salvage this, you've got to abort this plan. So now, now what do you do? You've got a wide open wound with exposed bone. You can't just put a tegaderm on this. What do you do? What, what'd you say? You're saying something. What's your name? You, you have an idea. What was your name? Um, that's a temporary fix. Graft. Yes, right. So you can skin graft this, right? But you can't put a skin graft on bare bone. So what you have to do is you have to turn that bare bone into a more favorable graft recipient site. So what you do, and why, why this is bleeding now, is you have to just take a burr and you burr down the outer layer of the bone bone because it's got two layers, right? It's got a cortical layer and a cancellous layer. You get to the bleeding part, you can put a skin graft on it. All right, so that's a skin graft. So that converts us into a safe thing. <coughs> is this the best answer? No, but it's the answer that's going to uh, temporize this wound and get him out of the hospital. All right, so here he is afterwards. So this is why you need a scalp on your head and not just skin, right? Because you can see these little areas of breakdown, right? Your scalp is thick compared to skin, and skin graft adhered to bone doesn't move. So it doesn't provide the kind of protection, the like, ideal protection that you need. So we talked to him about doing some uh, expanders or a free flap. He was like so traumatized from this whole thing, he just wanted to go on with life. But anyway, this is uh, fairly stable, and um, these are the kinds of things that you have to just, you know, again, take it to the home. So, any questions on that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just in terms of, from our management in the emergency department, aside yeah. from keeping the flap 
on what ice. can we do? On ice. Yeah, okay, yeah. on ice, <laughs> and then as far as like his actual... Okay, so That's that is a great question because this totally came up. This man has had a neck injury, a yank on a ponytail, enough to rip his scalp off. What imaging study do you want to get? C spine, right? You know, cervical spine X-ray, CT, right? Because he's he this man actually also had uh, some ligamentous cervical spine injury, right? You don't want to get that. Okay. Um, all right. Here's another Syracuse case. Another um, head trauma. So this was a bad MBA. He had a decompressive craniectomy. They could not put the flat back on the bone flat because of swelling. So now here he is. And there's no bone here. Okay, there's just soft tissue. He has to wear a helmet. So um, one of the things, the neurosurgeons, uh, once he was stable, the neurosurgeon said, well, you know, can you help us reconstruct this? Um, we want to put, you know, you, there are now lots of ways to prefabricate like bony flaps and things like that. We want to put a flap back on. So, but if you, you can see the skin is not very good, right? It's very like scarred, it's widened. If you try to put a bone flap back under there and then try to close the skin over it, it's not going to heal. It's going to be on a tight tension and it will probably dehiss and then you'll have a worse problem. So, how can you get extra skin in an area that's like the skin in the neighborhood? You got this. That's right. What you mean? Good, all right. Yes, that's exactly what you do. So basically, this is good skin. You can expand that skin just like you would use tissue expansion and breast reconstruction to give yourself more skin so that when you go to that flap in, you're not stretching the skin for dear life. So that is what we did. This is just showing you the back. All right, so tissue expanders are very versatile, but they are labor intensive. The patient has to be dedicated to coming to see you once a week. You expand it. it different expanders will tolerate different amounts usually maybe 20 to 30 cc's a week. There's a separate injection port, and um, you decide how much extra tissue you need. That determines the, uh, the time that it takes to expand it. So these are his pictures, because I clearly was not smart enough to take pictures during the expansion process, but the patient did. So you can see the bulge up here. That's an expander at the top. And uh, we just stretched it and stretched it, and then this is him afterward. And that's him now. So let me just tell you something. To, to make the point that um, patients are not inspired by their doctors, this patient was so inspired by this, this experience. I didn't include the slide, but if anyone is interested, I can show you later. He decided that his calling was in healthcare, and he. But in addition to that, he's also like um, a rapper. So he 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 uh, uh, he they had a CD really. <laughs> and he had pictures of like the hospital and him in front of the hospital. And in the liner notes, there's like a shout out to the doctors that took care of him, including me and the neurosurgeon. And so, like I showed this to my family when they asked me, why are you, what are you doing with all your time at the hospital? Like, getting shout outs from rappers in Syracuse. <laughs> all right, so he did well, okay? So, what would you do if this walked in? Now, by the way, it didn't walk in like this. This poor guy was uh, in a, an argument, and he had an eerie bulge. And now, this is the question that someone just asked about. I, I'm in a remote area, and this is exactly what happened. He had this area that's necrotic was a bulge. All right, so this is a large segment of his ear. I was in Syracuse. I get a phone. We had this call center. I get a phone call from three hours away. Hey. Ear revulsion, what should we do? We, we don't have anybody up here, can we just sew it back on? I was like, well, I think you should probably transfer him here, and uh, you know, we'll try to help you take care of it. Anyway, they did put it back on like this, I guess just to make sure it didn't get lost. <laughs> but by the time that he got to us, it was um, a while. Now, this is why you can't just reattach like an ear, because it's not just cartilage, it's cartilage and skin. And this is a large amount of tissue. There's no blood supply good enough to nourish this uh, like this. So if you were in this situation, what would you do with an ear avulsion? Put the same thing, similar to this everything mm -hmm. thing. Put, it, put the tissue on ice, try to keep it vitalized. And yeah, then what do you do? Transport it. Yes, <laughs> all right, you do do that. 
So in a situation like this, you, you can't just sew it back because exactly what happened here, it's going to die. So what we tried to do to salvage it was send him to hyperbaric. So you'd go to the hyperbaric chamber, it would pink up and look great, and then two hours after hyperbaric, it would start looking dusty again. So we couldn't salvage it. So what we did is we just had to kind of close it over. Now the thing to do in a situation like this is you actually, um, you know, the ear gets great blood supply, but these are small vessels relatively. So um, you basically take the skin off of that piece that's been evolved. Because you want to save the cartilage, right? The cartilage is the most important part. Ear cartilage is particularly contoured, right? And it's delicate. So if you at least you can save that, you can always cover a cartilage graft with skin and soft tissue. That's not the hard part. So you take that piece of cartilage, you take the skin off, and you bank it in the scalp. So make an incision behind the scalp and just bank it, right? Because you can save it for later. Let the wound get cleaned up and then bring him back, retrieve that ear, reattach it to the stuff, and then cover it with uh, a flap and some skin. Okay. But if you have a situation like this where you're out there and you don't have other resources, uh, the things to do to help try to promote survival are, you know, so you want to keep it cool, right? When you decrease the metabolic demands of a graft, uh, that helps you. Um, steroids, hyperbaric, and rheologic agents like dextran or aspirin or things like that can help. Because you want to, you don't want the blood vessels to clog off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you putting this directly on ice? Can that cause further injury, or are you putting it in cool? No, no. Like if you reattach it, then you just cool it with like an ice pack or something. You just want to bring the temperature mm -hmm. down a little bit. Yeah. What's the what the time period you have for cartilage? Well, in a situation like this, there isn't a time period. You just, you've got to, it's, it's too big, you've got to just... Um, well, oh, you mean if you did all those things? Well, the cartilage is going to start to die out and dry out, right? Because those little chondrocytes are super sensitive. So you want to get that done, ideally, within like a couple of hours. Yeah. But, you know, if you have a situation like this, and you need to reconstruct the ear later on, then you know you go to the rib, and we do that a lot in my kosher cases, with kids that are born without an ear, so that's what you do. Mm -hmm. All right, so I cannot have a, a given ER talk without including some peds cases, or Dr. Shaw would like yell at me, and she actually was generous enough to ask us to contribute to her uh, pediatric uh, atlas, which I think there's a third edition that's in the works right now. So. Many of you have seen auricular hematomas. This was a young child, I think after a fall. This is actually her picture, not mine. Um, so if you have a patient with an auricular hematoma, what do you do? Right, so that doesn't, that's not just like, let me stick a 25 gauge needle in here, see what I can aspirate, that's not enough. You have to make incisions. Um, you know, you kind of make them along the curve of the helix, right? So you make an incision where it's pointing. I would make one here and probably here so that you get dependent drainage. Always check the back. Sometimes there's a hematoma on the postauricular surface too. All right, so you've opened it, you've washed it out, then what do you do? How do you prevent it from reaccumulating? <coughs> Pressure. Yeah, so there are lots of ways to do that. You can use dental rolls if you can find them. Usually a zero form is readily available, so you just you know, you fold it over so that you get pressure and we will put it on the front and the back and then sew it through and through because you don't want that blood to reaccumulate. If it does, you get this. What's this called? Yeah, so this was a the most adorable eight-year-old who had to be removed from her home because this was a domestic violence situation. So she has a cauliflower ear. Why does this happen? Because the blood wasn't evacuated, the cartilage becomes fibrotic, and so this is all, when you feel this, it's super <coughs> firm, scarred cartilage, there are no landmarks here. So we actually um, attempted to try, there are um, descriptions of procedures where you can try to um, recontour this. It, it's, it's really hard, this is hard cartilage. You know, you see this on wrestlers and boxers and things like that, but this is what we did. We kind of wanted to carve out this, this is called the skateboard fossa here. So give the helix a little bit more definition. And you can see here too, right? The cartilage is like growing into our external auditory now. So we wanted to carve that out. So just give her a little bit more definition. So that's what we're after. Okay. Question. Yeah, shoot. Um, so if someone has a, a, a laceration to just the <coughs> cartilage, but the cartilage is not involved. Like let's say mm -hmm. the lower part of the ear is Will that skin throw back over? And it's like a flap of skin. We're not going to try to microvascularly reattach. You don't have to. You mean the skin's been? It's a bolus? Like, uh, 
let's say with it. Oh no, but in a situation like that, if there's still perichondrium, so hopefully there's still like perichondrium of the cartilage, then I would just do like wound care. Yeah. The simplest thing to do is a lot of acetracin and something that will stick. You can put a telpa or something not adherent because you don't want just gauze on that. Every time the patient pulls the gauze off, it's very painful. Um, yeah, the, the idea is to keep that area moist. Ointment is the best way. You want to get granulation tissue and then the skin will start to kind of contract and grow over it. And then if the patient needs a skin graft, that's that spot they can use. Yeah. Okay, so um, dog bites and other types of bites are another common reason that we get called emergently to the, um, to, to the emergency <coughs> room. This patient um, got too close to his neighbor's dog because the tip of his nose off. And um, this was in clinic, so this was, you know, a few days later, so you can see it's kind of dried out. You can see that that's the tip of the cart, the cartilage uh, of the tip of the nose is right there. So he's lost skin and soft tissue, and now it's dried out. So you have to, you would just ask, you've got to do wound care to this to get it cleaned up. You can't just put a skin wrap on this, it won't fail. Um, but once you do, once you get good wound care for this, now you've got like a healthy bed of granulation tissue that you can put a skin graft on. We talked about other uh, types of reconstruction. He was not interested in that. He just wanted something simple. But this patient had a bite from a, another person. So this was, so in Syracuse, we have a contractual relationship with the uh, corrections department. And so patients would be brought to us we also had to go to a clinic in one of the medium security facilities up there to see patients. <coughs> and uh, so he got in some guy's face and the guy bit the tip of his nose off. So you can see here, so this is what happens to wounds over time. Sometimes wound contraction is helpful, right? It makes wounds smaller. In a situation like this, where you have a free <coughs> edge, right? So tip of the nose, um, corner of the mouth, uh, eyelid, if those things contract, right, if you have a, a laceration of your lower eyelid, right, and it contracts, it's going to pull down. You'll get an atropia. So his nostrils contracted. So now we, we have two problems now, right? We've got a tissue loss problem, and now we've got a scar problem. So this has to all be opened up, and then the cartilage replaced and uh, soft tissue covered. So where would you, this is like a totally read my mind question, but maybe someone knows. If you need a lot of soft tissue to cover the tip of the nose, where would you get that from? Yeah, who said that? All right, yes, absolutely. So that's what you do. Because you, you can't just borrow from the rest of the nose. There's not enough skin. And actually, forehead skin ends up being a very good match for the tip of the nose. We use forehead flaps often in patients that have skin cancer of the nose, where they've lost a lot of soft tissue and they need cartilage replacement. It's a fantastic donor site you have to tell the patient that they're going to look like this for three weeks. So this forehead flap was, this flap of skin was originally up here, and you basically rotate it 180 degrees and you sew it onto the tip of the nose. There you go. They have to stay like that for three weeks, right? Because you have to rely on ingrowth from the surrounding tissue before you divide that flap. So you got to, there's a lot of um, patient counseling involved in doing an operation like this, right? Like, you can't wear glasses. All right, so that's him uh, after. He's got the same happy look that he had. <laughs> He's still healing. So I'm going to tell you an interesting story about this. This is, this is a continuity of care story. This is like, you guys have all these ACGME uh, core competencies, right? Continuity of care is one of them. This is a perfect example of that. So I'm sitting in my office here. I've like been here for two or three years. I get a phone call saying, hey, Dr. Butts. Mr. X is on the phone for you. I'm like, cool. He's like, yeah, Mr. X, he says he knew you from Syracuse. You took care of his nose. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. So he's out of jail now, and he's looking for me. Like, he was, <laughs> he was, not in a bad way. Like, you know, hey, I'm out now. Is there anything more I need to, like, touch us up a little bit? I'm like, oh, my goodness. The, the joys of the internet. OK, anyway. So, all right. So. I want to talk a little bit about another emergency situation where there um, is overlap between otolaryngologist neurology and the emergency room. And I think there should be better collaboration and better kind of crosstalk amongst our specialties because I have a feeling that all three specialties develop guidelines about Bell's palsy and facial nerve problems that um, where there is some overlap. And I think if we all talk to each other more, we'd um, 
avoid some misses and make sure these patients get good care. So in 2013, our academy developed a clinical practice guideline on the management of Bell's policy. So um, there are some good recommendations in here which I'll review, but I think the most important thing that to, is to make sure that we are all on the same page about what the definition of Bell's palsy is, because I think that's one of the areas where um, just in communicating there's sometimes a difference. So who has a definition of Bell's palsy they want to share? Oh, before I just give the answer. How do you define it if you make the diagnosis? How do you define that that's what it is? So number one, it has to be acute onset, right? If somebody comes in and says, my face has been gradually getting weak for the last six months, that's not Bell's palsy, right? That's something else, maybe a tumor, something more dangerous. So acute and onset. The patient, I woke up this morning and my face was drooping, okay? So acute onset, number one. Um, second thing they'll tell you, or they may tell you, is there can sometimes in the history be a preceding like um, viral URI symptoms or things like that. You're not always going to find that, but one of the things that shouldn't be in the history is any like history of trauma, surgery to the area that would affect the face of her um, mass in the parotid gland, right? So remember, we just talked about the fact that the facial nerve runs through the parotid gland, and one of the um, dangerous signs of a parotid malignancy is actually facial nerve weakness because if you have a parotid malignancy that has invaded the facial nerve, that is not Bell's palsy. And do not be shocked to hear that there are patients who have received the diagnosis of Bell's palsy who actually had a parotid malignancy, not by anyone here, but I'm just saying this is these are the referrals that we get, um, who was told they had Bell's palsy, who really had a parotid malignancy and it delayed the diagnosis. And so that is obviously something you never want to miss. So, um, the definition of Bell's palsy that we utilize in this guideline is acute unilateral facial nerve crisis, right? Because there are conditions where patients can have bilateral facial nerve weakness, we'll talk about them. Onset within less than 72 hours without another identifiable cause. So just guys, throw it out at me. Differential facial nerve paralysis. And what other things can cause it? Okay, what else? Okay, oh, well we already said that. <laughs> What else? All right, the patient says, I was, yes, I was in the woods in Connecticut, and I have a, like, something bit me, and then their face is bit Yeah, ask them about that. There, there is not 100% agreement that any patient that comes up with a unilateral acute facial nerve paralysis has to have a Lyme test, but if the history points to it, get it. You, you may be the genius that figures out that someone had Lyme, because again, another, disease that can have vague symptoms, and it's sometimes in these situations just because somebody didn't ask. What else? Uh, MS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a super long list, by the way. Hold on. All right, this is one list, and it's probably not even complete, right? So, by the way, a variety of autoimmune diseases. I saw a patient in the office. She'd been seen in the Kings County emergency room. Very interesting case. It wasn't interesting to her though. She came in, she had acute onset of parotid swelling and facial nerve paralysis. What's the diagnosis? Mumps or pass? No. What'd you say, mumps? Yeah. No. It's a variant of sarcoidosis. It's called uveal parotid fever, also known as Hereford's disease. Look it up, okay? This lady had that. She came back into the, to see me. The facial nerve weakness had resolved because she was over her like acute crisis, we got an ACE level positive, okay? So I'm just saying, think widely about these cases. Autoimmune diseases are just in the right person, right, middle-aged women, think about it. So anyway, that's one take home point. Not, there's a, there's a great quote, quote, not all, Paul, um, I'm not gonna get it right. Not all facial nerve weakness is Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is a diagnosis of exclusion. You are obligated to rule out the super dangerous things before you give a patient that diagnosis. Why? Well, because of one of the uh, recommendations here, which is that you're giving someone high dose oral steroids for maybe five days. And by high dose, I mean like we typically recommend 60 milligrams per kilogram, right? That's a big dose, which can come with some downsides, right? So if you are going to make that recommendation, be very sure that that's the right diagnosis, okay? Um, so when we have a patient uh, that has facial nerve paralysis or paresis, right, 
Um, this is one of the most commonly used grading systems. It's called the House Brackman uh, grading system. It goes from one to six. It actually was not originally designed for acute facial nerve paralysis, but it's what's used, I think, because it's easy, right? The main thing, um, the one important cutoff is if the patient cannot, if the patient can only partially close the eye, at a minimum, there are four, right? If you can get your eye closed, you're three or less, okay? And then the other um, categorizations have to do with how much like asymmetry you have at rest and things like that. Okay, so. Um, in general, Bell's palsy, the only upside about it is that in the majority of cases, it's self-limited. Most patients will have a full recovery. So, another important thing to know, and obviously this is once the patient has, they're not in the ER anymore, but um, if a patient has been given the diagnosis of Bell's palsy, and four months later, they're still weak, like completely weak, that is not Bell's palsy, okay? That is something else. And, um, our obligation is to um, get an MRI to figure out why they are still very weak four months after their acute onset of, or acute onset of facial nerve paralysis. One of the things that can happen, there, there are a group of patients who don't have full recovery, I'm gonna show you that. When the nerve is recovering, if it recovers fully, there's like no sequela. But if it doesn't recover properly, you can develop something called synchinesis, which is um, aberrant regeneration, right? So the nerve fibers don't all go back to the nerve branch they should have gone to, right? Fibers that should go to the eye go to the mouth instead, right? And then you get something called mass movement. I'm going to show you an example of that. So this is one strong recommendation, oral steroid should be given within 72 hours of the onset. So that's why that 72 hour window is important because after that I think the efficacy of giving high dose steroids is less and less. So antiviral monotherapy, they come in, you say, hey, let's give you some Valtrex alone. Not recommended. Valtrex with steroids, there may be some benefit. Valtrex alone is not recommended, okay, because it hasn't been shown to work at all. All right, the combination, you can certainly do it. All right, and then eye care, right? So if the patient's severely weak and they can't close their eye, that's a danger. Their cornea is at risk of drying out. So one of the things that you want to discharge them home with is artificial tears, lack of lube at night, tell them to wear glasses. If they don't wear glasses for correction, then have them wear sunglasses when they go out. This is one of the most preventable, but um, kind of catastrophic things that can happen to a patient that has facial nerve paralysis, because if they get a corneal ulceration, um, that's not treatable when you're talking about a corneal transplant. Okay, so this is preventable. All right. So if they can't close their eye well, so this is where the facial plastic surgeon comes in, we can do something called an upper gold weight um, procedure where you actually load the upper lid with the gold weight that weighs the lid down so they can actually get closure, right? You can use gold, you can use platinum, <coughs> like platinum isn't necessarily like cooler or better because it costs more, but actually platinum is a little bit lower profile, so I think patients like that better because they don't like the gold sometimes from, from a gold weight. And uh, we already talked about the history. And then follow up, right? So this is our job, right? If, if we get called to the emergency room by you all to see a patient with acute onset facial nerve paralysis, our job is to make sure that patient has follow up with us within a week or so. Because if they're not recovering, then they need to get an MRI, all right? And this is that algorithm. It, this is too hard to read right here, but if any of you that would like it, or actually I can email um, Dr. Selby our um, guideline if you guys would like to have it around. Them. All right, so what's wrong here? What's the weak side, right or left? So is this, wait, hold on, let me for you. Is this the weak side or is this the weak side? You think this is the weak side? No, this is the normal side. All right, so let me tell you his background. This is the exception to the rule that Bell's palsy recovers. This patient was seen in RER, everything was done right. He had, if you had seen this man a year ago, this side of the face would be completely flaccid, completely weak. So he was treated with high dose steroids, then kind of got lost to follow up a little bit. And then this happened. So what's going on here? Yeah, so this is synkinesis or hyperkinesis actually, right? So this is aberrant regeneration of the facial nerve. So when the fibers regenerated, too many went here. 
rather than up here. You can see the forehead is weak, right, because he doesn't have any creases here, right, compared to here. You can see that too many fibers went here. This is him at rest. This is not him doing anything, squinching, anything like that. He walks around with his eye half closed all the time. Why? Because he has too many nerve fibers here, and this is what hyperkinesis is. It's too many fibers here, that's why the nasal labial fold is contracted at rest. That's the, that is why you're, you could get fooled here. The corner of the mouth is a little bit twisted and asymmetric. So this is when you ask him to lift the eyebrow. So this is weak. When he closes his mouth, the corner of the mouth actually moves a little bit. That's synkinesis, right? When he closes his eye, it's just everything is, things are not coordinated at all, okay? All right, what would you do for him? What can you do for him? Like is there a medication that could help? Botox. Yes, who said that? Yes, Botox is a fantastic medication for <laughs> post paralysis synchronesis. Okay, it's not just for you know looking beautiful, it's for that. But um, so, in a, in a patient like this who has hyperkinesis, you need you don't want to paralyze this muscle completely, but you want to weaken it so that he actually has normal tone, he's got too much tone, right. So the plan was to inject his orbicularis octave a little bit. We actually injected this forehead a little bit. So you would say, well, why would you do anything to the normal side? Well, it's to balance both sides so that when he does kind of raise his eyebrows, the, dis the discrepancy is not exaggerated. And he had a lot of like mentalis strain here and neck strain because of the platysma. So he was having neck pain. So we had all this. All right, so that's how he looks at rest when he came back in. So he comes back into the office. Um, maybe two or three weeks later, and I see him walking down the hall, and I am like doing cartwheels. And I was like, this is great. I walk into the office and say, hey, Mr. X, how do you feel? Are you happy? And he's like, oh, don't know. Okay. Like, wait a minute, what? So I showed him, so this is why you take before and after pictures, right? Because I showed him the he had forgotten how bad it was. <laughs> so I showed him the before pictures, I showed him these pictures, and he's like, oh my god. That's what it, it was that bad. Like, yes, sir. <laughs> All right, so now, this is him at rest. So now he can open his eye. Can you imagine how socially embarrassing it is to go to a restaurant with your family with your eyes squinched up? It's terrible, right? All right, so that's before and that's after. Okay? Before and after, right? So I may have overtreated that forehead a little bit. He should have a good <laughs> Live and learn. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> so um, all right, so this is smiling. Now, again, he had bells. He's still weak, but at least he's got more symmetry now, right? All right, much better. You can go out in public now. All right, this is a man who had a facial nerve weakness from a, a this is not completely relevant, it's, it's a cool case. Um, he had a skull base tumor removed. And the nerve was not involved, but it was in the, in the way. So he had weakness that didn't resolve. So his lower facial tone is not great. This causes problems with chewing, right? Your buccinator muscle helps keep the bolus where you want it to chew, you bite the side of the mouth. And he's just, he's got a terrible droop. And again, this is at rest, right? So the house Brackman scale, we keep you six. So there are things that you can do to improve the lower facial tone. And one of those is a really, um, ingenious operation where you borrow the central fibers of the temporalis muscle, right? You can, you can do without some of it. And you invert that muscle, you turn it over the zygomatic arch and you plug it into the corner of the mouth. Now, if you can still chew, you can activate that temporalis muscle. So if the patient um, trains himself, you get a little excursion of the corner of the mouth when you bite down and move it. Down. So that is what we did for him. So that's before and that's after surgery. It's kind of bulky a little bit. Now, he came into the office actually just yesterday, just in time for this lecture. So he still had, the, the only thing that he didn't like and that we felt could bear some improvement was that the skin was still very loose, right? Because he doesn't have any facial tone. He doesn't have muscles that keep the skin taut. So we actually offered him a facelift. <coughs> Did a facelift on this side to remove some of that um, droopy skin and that is him just yesterday. Okay. So when he, this is before and that's after. So now his, the corner of his mouth doesn't droop so much. And when he bites the back teeth, he can get a little bit of experience. All right. So 
with a few minutes left, we're going to just talk a little bit about bony trauma. When um, we get called to the emergency room for facial fractures, the mandible is probably one of the most commonly evolved sites. Nasal fractures probably a little bit more. And then, you know, obviously there are different sites of the mandible that are involved most frequently. The condyle and the symphysis slash body are often involved just because, you know, they're in the way of a punch or something like that. So I'm going to show you a case that you guys are all going to totally diagnose. All right. She was playing, running around at home. She fell on her chin. Do you see the bruise right there? Okay. There. When she opens her mouth, her chin deviates to the right, to the left. What kind of fracture does this girl have? Yeah, I know that. What kind of <laughs> what, what part of the mandible is involved? Fell on her chin, chin deviates to the left side. Mm -mm. Condyle. This is actually, this could go in a textbook. This is like path and mnemonic for condyle fracture. So you're probably saying, well, she fell on her chin. Why does she have a, this is her CT scan. Why does she have a condyle fracture? Well, because in kids, the condylar neck is one of the thinnest parts of the mandible. And the force from the blow, even on the chin, gets transmitted up along the ramus. And it snaps the bone at the weakest place. And that's where this is. So the other thing you can see is this condyle is not only really snapped, it's completely dislocated, right? So this is a pearl. Condylar fracture, particularly like along the neck, the chin points to the side of the fracture. It's pointing, it's telling you where the fracture is, all right? The chin, when the patient opens their mouth, the chin deviates to the side of the fracture. If it's a cooperative patient, which, you know, she's four, but in an adult, the other thing you'll see is that you will get premature contact with the molars on the side of the fracture. Right, why? Because the height of the jaw is lessened because of this tipping over, mm -hmm. and you will see an, a posterior open bite opposite. So that's the combination. The chin points to the fracture, and there's a posterior open bite opposite the fracture. If you know those things, and that mechanism is right, you, you of course you need the radiologist, but you will know what the diagnosis is. You will be able to predict it, okay? So that's her. So how would you treat her? Does she need surgery? She's four. Is surgery the best option in a four year old? I feel like if we go through in the same room, get them as close together as possible. Well, actually, surgery is not the best option. Not even no, like no, no, closing. Like try, to, try to get them close together. No, with the surgery. that doesn't help. You know why? Because if she had come back for follow up like a year later and we re imaged her, that condo would be standing straight up. Okay, the, the beauty of children is that they are like bone making machines. And then the condyle is a growth center, okay? This is, this is a picture from a textbook, okay? <laughs> to show, it's the same sign, right? He's got the same bruise as our patient. Um, I think that's a CT scan. So um, this is to compare the way a condyle looks in a child compared to an adult. It's shorter, it's stubbier, and, but it remodels really, really quickly. So surgery actually could be harmful in a patient like this. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to put them in arch bars. You don't have to do anything except get them moving. Because if you don't have them move and they keep their jaw closed, you're gonna develop something called ankylosis. And in a kid, that's even more common because the, the head of the condyle is so vascular that it, it heals, but it, it seals, sort of. So uh, physical therapy, pain management, soft diet, that is the treatment of choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shoot. Um, what if the uh, fracture is at the, uh, the growth plate? Well, the condyle is a growth plate. So you could, it would still go Leave, it, leave it alone. You know what's going to happen if you try to go into that joint and start mucking around in there and putting a, number one, putting a titanium plate in a four-year-old is a bad <coughs> idea because they're growing. So the hardware is going to migrate or extrude. You're going to cause scar, and then you'll cause a growth problem, right? Because you've induced scar into an area that should be growing. So the best thing to do is get them moving, opening their mouth. It's, it's really incredible. People don't believe that this should work, but it does. All right, this is a young girl. I think I had been here maybe like four or five months. We were actually doing resident interviews, and we were wrapping up, and then one of the residents was like, please come with me. This girl was standing outside of school. She got hit by a bus. So she's 17. And this is, you know, this is the other end of the spectrum, right? This is a massive disruption with soft tissue and bone, and so number one, you can see that she has a trait. So the, one of the things where you know, we're collaborating with you all and making decisions in the emergency room is how to handle the airway in a patient like this. 
she actually was like her airway was stable, meaning like she was talking and she wasn't in distress. But you know, there's a lot of bleeding here and things like that. So I think if she's stable, this is a person who you know you want to keep your eye on. She should be very very close to a lot of people walking by on a monitor until she gets upstairs. And then uh, I think we fiber optically intubated her in the operating room. But yeah, no, a trach you, you got to get the tube out of the way. So she was trached, and then this is how she she lost a ton of teeth. But we were able to get the bone back together with all that hardware that you see right there, and that's her post production film. All right, so eye fractures. Right, this is another common reason that we get called, and there are a variety of reasons why or theories about how the bone actually breaks uh, in a blowout fracture. But um, there's another situation where you don't want to miss something. So let's say uh, you have like a 16 year old, they were, uh, I don't know what's the scenario. They're playing around with their friends, they're horsing around. One of the guys kind of accidentally punches his friend in the face. And there's not a lot of bruising, but he's like saying the eye hurts, his mother makes him go to the hospital. He, doesn't want to stay, he's like, you know, he's kind of not cooperative with the examination. Um, but here's what you notice, he's, his heart rate is 32, he's nauseous, and he feels like he's gonna pass out. What's going on? Yes, absolutely right. So, for some reason, in kids, at, particularly adolescents, see the fracture here? So, it, it's hard to see this fracture because it's very tiny. But the force was enough to basically propel this fat around the orbit through this very, very <coughs> tiny fracture, which is this fat is now being strangulated. So this is entrapment, right? It's not a huge fracture, but it's enough to strangulate that soft tissue. And that's right, the oculocardiac reflex or the ocular vagal reflex, um, it's a reflex loop. And if the patient has those symptoms, do not like send them home and tell them to, just, that's an emergency, like that patient needs immediate surgery because number one, their vitals are not stable and the longer that sits strangulated, the harder their time they're gonna have getting a um, good function back afterwards. So that's uh, something you don't wanna miss. Sometimes we do four suctions in the emergency room, Opto will do them too. If you're worried, if you wanna make the difference between a, like an entrapment or just a nerve injury when the patient has diplopia, that's how you do it. You grab the conjunctiva of the globe and you just move it around. If there's resistance, then you have entrapment. And these are some recommendations which I can also send to Dr. Selby about um, just kind of what to do in the immediate setting and then some of the things we do in terms of management. Dr. Yeah, wrap it up, thank you. All right, so um, I'm gonna move it along. I'll just tell you, this was supposed to be a video of how to do a lateral campotomy. We don't have to do them very often, um, but I did one with one of my residents, one of the chiefs maybe, six months ago across the street in a patient who, oh yeah, this lady got shot in the face and she had, was like an evolving retrovulbar hematoma and she was losing her vision. And so in a situation like that where you suspect someone has a retrovulbar hematoma, do you send them for a CAT scan? Mm -mm. No, this is a clinical diagnosis, okay? What are the things you would see? Proptosis. Right, proptosis, severe eye pain. They may have ophthalmoplegia, right? They can't move the eye. They, the pupillary reflex is gone. They may lose red vision. If you have that case and you're worried, if, you, if it crosses your mind, do it, okay? It takes five minutes, not even, and you may save someone's vision. And if you wait for the CT scanner and you're waiting for all these other things, the patient may lose their vision, okay? Send me the video. Actually. Absolutely. All right. What's this? Yeah. So don't sleep on this one. Yet. Okay. Drain this immediately. I have seen not no one here, but I have seen. Uh, you know, we see all the crazy stuff, right? So if this gets left alone, the patient will develop a septal perforation. That's really hard to do. Okay. So let's. This is nasal fractures. Okay, so let's just, in the last few minutes, let's just talk about, um, you know, we, this has been very clinically based and that's interesting, but I think, you know, we're, we have several opportunities where we can collaborate and think about clinical research. And so this is a research project that was done here, um, looking at pain management protocols in patients that have mandibular trauma. Every person in this room is 
very aware of the opioid crisis that we're in the midst of. Everybody had to do their three-hour training. If you haven't done it, do it. <laughs> um, we're challenged in facial trauma because there's a high proportion of patients who have facial fractures, who need adequate pain control, but who have substance abuse issues or other health issues that make using narcotics very challenging. So this is a systematic review that we did just looking at what is like the reporting of pain use in trauma patients. And no one in this room will be surprised to hear that it's not very good. Meaning like people don't even talk about it. You can't develop good pain management strategies in people and you can't talk about alternatives to opioids if you don't even figure out how opioids are good or bad or what the efficacy is, right? If you don't ask about complications. So that's what we aim to do here. One of the other areas of interest that has developed for us is looking at whether there is an association between uh, head concussions and facial trauma patients. And it shouldn't be a stretch to imagine that if you've sustained an injury to your facial bones strong enough to break a bone, some of that injury might be transmitted to your brain. Why? Because your facial skeleton's job is to protect your brain from injury. But again, this is another example of where we don't have the information, not because it's out there, not because we don't see enough patients with facial trauma, but because like we're not, I'm talking about our specialty, we're not asking the questions, right? The tools to screen for concussion, you all probably know much better than I do. There's some variation in like, you know, which ones are most user friendly, which are most valid, but at any rate, we're lucky at Downstate because we have a terrific concussion team here that was, it's headed by Dr. Urban and his group and it's multidisciplinary. So we thought, well, let's take advantage of that. The hypothesis of the study is that trauma forces that result in facial fractures may also have a concomitant uh, associated concussion and that um, concussions in facial trauma patients are underdiagnosed. So we're going to, and it was kind of it's an extension of a, some research done in Syracuse that so they looked at mandible fracture patients and found that up to 75% of patients with an isolated mandible fracture were at risk of having a concussion. Like that, that's incredible when you think about it. So um, we're using a questionnaire called the MATE, which is a military acute concussion evaluation. And it's a, a fairly straightforward questionnaire. Um, it, it uses a variety of cognitive questions. You come up with a score at the end. If the patient has a score of less than 25, they're felt to be at risk of having a concussion. It's not diagnosing a concussion, it's determining risk. Can only fully diagnose concussion, obviously, with the help of neurologic evaluation. But this is looking at risk. And that's what we'll be doing. We're recruiting patients, adult patients only. We're administering the maze that has to be done within 24 hours of the injury. And then we're evaluating them at time point two to see like what the natural history of their symptoms are, usually 10 to 14 days. And um, you know, we'll, we'll see where we get. But this is our team. Dr. Valeski is one of the co-PIs. Uh, Dr. Francisco from Neurology. Um, residents are Anthony Alessi, Hope Tate is one of our, I'm so glad she like, she, she called me, she's like, hey, I'm Massa Dowson. I'm like, great, you can stay involved in the research project. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have residents from the emergency department, our department in oral maxillofacial surgery, and then our awesome medical student is Russell No. he's a rising second year, and he's actually the one that you'll see if you see him in the ER running around with the maze, asking patients like to repeat the months of the year backwards and stuff like that. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them, and thanks for having me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about if we get this facial trauma report from an older adult patient, who we call? How do we... You, I will uh, let Dr. Selby know. Generally, you guys don't have to do, this is more to let you know that we're doing the project. You, there's no obligation on your part to call us. Usually, you call us for the consult anyway, and all of our residents know that we're enrolling in the study, but um, you can call or pay to me um, anytime. Uh, Dr. Buck, sorry. Yeah? So, just a question from Logistics at Kings County. Sure. Because uh, OMFS covers facial trauma, mm -hmm. so would you like this? No, we're working together with them. Them. They, they know to call. Yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Thank you.